I really suck at coming up with titles for talks. Um, but this was the only way I could do it. So it's a kind of a mixture that we have of, um, of the manager that nags developers that says, are we done yet? Where are we? Are we there? Did we get there? It's kind of like my kids in the back seat of a long journey, right? You're five minutes out of home, and so how much longer do we have? You know, so that's the first thing that came along. And at another level, it was also a case of uh, me just reflecting upon many years of working with teams, uh, my own teams and with other companies' teams. Um, and being involved in this agile community for, for quite a while, and we come through these conferences over and over, and there's a lot of repetition. And I think the repetition is valuable. It's a necessary repetition to start off with because there's always new people walking through the building. So we need to hear, hear that. And maybe sometimes we need to repeat it so that we can actually start believing it as well. Um, but in all this time, did we achieve this magical nirvana of software development that we seem to be aiming for? Okay. So there's this mixture of something that's quite literal and something that's quite philosophical. It's a kind of topic that I could actually do zero preparation for and ask all of you to gather at these round tables. And I'll say, here's a topic. Please discuss it in your groups and then report back. And then we'll pick one or two things and say, OK, how about discussing that a little bit more detail? And, you know, and then I'd do nothing. You know, I'll just facilitate it and you'd do everything. So, it's not that I uh, have some evangelism and gospel to reveal unto you today, okay? Um, I'm going to put down some ideas and things that I've tried in practice um, that seem to have worked for me. Uh, your mileage may vary. You might walk out of here thinking, well, that's an absolute load of, or bucket of whatever. Um, or you might pick up something and try it. So I'm going to try to speak for less than an hour. I want to have a kind of a discussion from you, OK? So before I go on, uh, just a show of hands. Oops, I still got my pencil in my ear. Um, show of hands, who's, who's on the manager's side of the world and who's managers first, people who manage teams? Regardless, OK, I know it's a management track, but any, anyone here who has that, uh, like an architecture or lead developer role or basically got hands on keyboard writing code, lying to managers about how far we are? Anyone with a dual role? OK. OK, you're really conflicted, right? Just like me. OK. So before we go further, oh, one more thing. I'm going to do an experiment with you. I'm going to do a very non-linear presentation, right? I don't have slides that go one after the other, OK? It'll be dancing around. And it's an absolute experiment. So even if you catch me outside, tell me whether it worked or not. Because this is a kind of topic where I couldn't actually create one linear sequence of things. There are so many tangents. So I've chosen another tool to actually do the presentation. So uh, things will move around on the screen, ignore the motion, and focus on the content. So let's just focus on this guy here, which is myself. So who am I? Um, Aslam Khan. That's my blog, Free Your Mind, F3YourMind, FreeYourMind.net. Uh, um, if you have trouble sleeping, you can read that blog. It's fantastic for insomnia. Um, I'm a software developer. Uh, the reason why I call myself a software developer is because my mom, who's 82 years old, has a reasonable understanding to explain to all the family uh, what I do. Okay. If I say architect, it gets confusing. If I say coach, it gets even more confusing. So it's just software developer, mom. You can tell them that it's something to do with that. Sometimes she says I fix the internet, but that's another story. Um, so I'm from Cape Town. Uh, in South Africa. This is my second trip to India. I was born in South Africa. Um, so two data points here for the conference last year for the first time, second time. It's now a pilgrimage for me. Uh, and I absolutely love being here in India. I don't know why it took so long. Um, I have spent more than half my life writing software and getting paid to write software. So that's the professional capacity, right? In all of that, it's only in the last year or so I've realized that my whole life, I've been just trying to balance everything. 
there's conflicts that, pick, that pop up all the time. And often, I always try to make one side win. And it's only now, right, that I realize that, okay, that's such a futile effort to get one side to win. There must be a nice sweet spot somewhere in between. So this is what I'm doing. And this thing that we'll talk about today is about that sweet spot, perhaps, that we're trying to find between managers of teams and the teams themselves. Okay. Um, and what is the thread that actually works through that? So it's based on observation. I'm going to present a few case studies, real-world examples. Uh, things are blurred out. You don't need to see the text. It's there to save confidentiality very mildly. I could get sued, I guess. Um, but we'll, we'll work through some of those things. And if any of you are going to come to the technical track, um, the case studies I'm going to repeat, but in the technical track I'm going to talk about at an engineering level what led to this and some things we can try to correct that at a technical level, right? So this is more at the human level. So the first case study is actually a software product, right? It's in the supply chain industry. Um, I've worked with this company for about six years, right? No, yeah, now six years. Um, and very early on, I asked them, someone on the technical side, please show me your architecture. Give me a picture, you know, so I can see what's going on. Um, and they gave this to me, okay? Um, and I couldn't make head or tail of it, right? It looked really nice and compartmentalized, and I thought it was all one product, um, until they said that that's actually version one. And they, the color scheme is very appropriate here because the internal code name for version was, was black box. So you know what version two was called, right? Red box. And version three was called blue box. And the other one, it was in version four, okay? So here's the thing, right? They actually, over a period of time, went through several iterations, came up with new versions. The problem was that every version was in production. Right? Every single version was in production. The green stuff at the bottom, where I also was about to say green box, is actually some magical thing that they've concocted to just start integrating data between these things. Right? So I even put a question mark there, because it's not really integration. It's just some weird thing that they've put together. But that's not the interesting thing about this problem. Right? So here's a look at that. The writing might be a bit small, but I'll read it out to you. So when I started looking at the lines of code, Version 1 was about 800,000 lines of code. Version 2, the red box, was about 650,000 lines of code. And version 3 was about 700,000 lines of code. Okay. The number of developers on version 1 was 8. The one on version 2 were 6 people in the team. Version 3 was 20 people on the team. And here's the killer. Version 1 was about 65% complete before they decided to do a rewrite to version 2. A rewrite, okay? Version 2, they managed to get up to about 80%. And version 3 is sitting at about, was sitting at about 50%. You've got 20 developers. You've got 700,000 lines of code for 50% completion when version 2 was 80% complete with six people Right? And 600,000 lines of code. And you can just look at the picture at how much version 3 is, but it doesn't even touch the functionality of version 2. There's something horribly wrong here. Okay, so that's, let's leave them for a while. There's another case study. This is an enterprise software in the insurance industry. Okay, now you don't even have to read the pictures. Uh, read the boxes and what they mean. They're completely meaningless, right? But this was at a namespace level. This is at a, mod, a fairly high level static analysis of the code that I did. And so at a particular level, elevated, high view down, this is what it looks like. So you're ignoring the boxes and their labels, you can see the cyclic dependencies, right? How things are interrelated, okay? And from an engineering point of view, we kind of know that when we have those kinds of loops, it creates a disaster, right? 
So it's not so much the loops, but the quantity of those that's attached, that the number of dependencies. Now, this is absolutely real, right? Some of those dependencies, I, 95,000 dependencies between two modules. 95,000 times something is referencing this other thing. 95,000 unique, distinct references between this and that. 95,000, okay? 10,000, 43,000, okay? So this has got to be the most insane code base I've ever seen, right? I was involved, I was asked to help them with one central component. That central component had 90 dependencies on its own. 90 at the first level. So I put this down, I need 90 things in order to work with this thing. 90, right? The main piece of logic was 4,500 lines long. You know how many screenfuls, you know how many page downs that is to get to around to this? I typically shrink code I reduce the font size. If I reduced it down to two-point font, I still couldn't fit it onto a screenfull. Okay? This was the most important piece of code here. So they've been using you know, uh, Scrum for two years. There were waterfall before that. This is an inherited code base, right? There's nothing about the process that can fix this. Nothing about the process they follow. They're actually a very good Scrum team. Very, very good Scrum team, okay? But the problem is that this is still under active development, and the manager is always nagging the development team about why is this feature not ready yet, etc. okay? There's a demand from business. This thing is responsible for calculating insurance premiums across portfolios, etc. So it's a critical part of their business, right? But it's a legacy problem that they've inherited. By the way, I forgot to mention to you that the previous case study was seven years of development using extreme programming, okay? Then the last one is actually for a company that were actually doing, it was tools. It was just very bespoke tools within the company and it was just integration. Again, you don't have to look at the numbers, but if you can see the railroad network between things. But if you squint and look at it with blurred eyes, you'll notice that there's about three things on one side and three things on the other side, right? So what this thing's responsibility was, was actually to bridge three disparate web services. It looks like this on this side, and it looks like that on that side. Take this from here, transform it, make it work like that on the other side, okay? The problem here, it was a very simple requirement with a highly complicated solution. The consequence, simple, trivial changes, results in a long defect list because you don't know which railroad you have to follow to see what the dependencies are, et cetera, okay? This is two years of development with one year with Scrum, okay? And again, the adoption has been extremely good, right? So there's a problem here, okay? There's three quite different cases, right? Product company, enterprise software, tools, all have been through various levels of maturity for agile adoption. Um, no one actually sat down in those teams and said, let's create the worst designed software ever, right? No one did that. No one said, let's see if we can make this the worst software, right? I don't think anybody sits down and does that. But this is what happens to software over time. And over time, what happens is that when you start asking as a manager, are we there yet? The answer is not yet. And you'll get that answer more often because this is degradation of the design over time. And it's not deliberate. No one is actually sitting down and saying, well, hey, let's just go and create another 2,000 dependencies here just for the heck of it. Let's see what the next team does, you know. No one does that, you know. You don't put down on your resume, I've created so many dependencies, you know, it's not a stripe you wear. So there's, there's something here. So who's at fault? Is it a team? Engineering team? Is it the architect, that main guy up there where the buck stops at? Who, who's it? I mean, you, you're saying you on both sides. The manager, so it's easy, you're at fault completely, right? So 
that's an easy one. We can just blame you. It's fine. You're the manager. You're the architect. You're the team. It's fine. But there must be something that's, that's not working here, right? So let's get, try to get to the essence of that. So this reminded me of something I read many years ago uh, by Fred Brooks. And this is the third or fourth time at this conference that Fred Brooks has come up. Okay, he wrote a famous set of essays, firstly in about 1975, I think it was. Yeah, he published it. And the second edition he published in 1995. It's called The Mythical Man Month, right? Um, and it's essays in software engineering. The famous one is No Silver Bullets. Uh, but there's another paper, essay in there, which deals with this thing called conceptual integrity. Right? And this is what he says. He says, I will contend, right? so he's willing to debate this, I will contend that conceptual integrity is the most important consideration in system design. It is the most important thing in system design. It is better to have a system omit certain features than to have one that contains independent and uncoordinated ideas. So don't just throw every idea in. That's basically what he's saying. That there's a certain integrity of the entire system that determines the success of that system. How we work with it. That's what he's saying. All right. So when I reflected upon this, and this is something that I've now, this idea of conceptual integrity is something I've been trying to apply over the years, several years now. And in each case, conceptual integrity of these cases that I put forward was destroyed. It was gone, right? And the conceptual integrity is the responsibility of the architect and the manager. Okay. I'm going to use those two terms very loosely. Manager to mean anything that's not engineering, right? Whether it's a development manager, a divisional manager, it's a product owner, it's a product manager, it doesn't matter. You can create the, your own impression. But someone who's not directly hands-on engineering. An architect is someone who's not the manager, who is doing hands-on engineering, right? Whether it's one person or a group of people, it doesn't matter. So I'll speak about them in the singular. So let's think about this thing called conceptual integrity for a while, okay? What is this mythical beast? And how is conceptual integrity the interplay between the architect and the manager? So in the world of movies, right, if you had to try to create roles through a metaphor here, the architect is the director. And the manager is the producer. The manager is managing the constraints, and the, ar and the architect is the one who's making things happen. So that's the roles that we're looking at here. So there's two halves, OK? The one half is on the architecture side. It's fine? OK. And the architecture side has a responsibility without reservation to fulfill the requirements of the user, of the customer, unreservedly. They have no other higher purpose than to fulfill the needs of the customer. It doesn't matter what the design is and the architecture is and what technology they're using. First and foremost, this is what I'm putting onto the table. You need to decide, you need to give the customer the highest priority. Right, firstly. On the other side, on the producer's side, this side is responsible for managing the constraints of the project. Okay? The constraints of the project are typical. It's old-fashioned project management. It's people, capacity, budgets, all of those things. Those are constraints. That's what producers do. They look after the, those things. Okay? So let's focus on this part. There's this weird term that we have in agile circles called value. I'm not even going to try to define that. Jeff Patton gave a definition yesterday about outcomes versus output. Right? You measure the outcome. You can't predict value up front, um, which is a nice definition. But I'm going to say this. right? To create value, in order to create value, the architecture side needs to maintain this mythical thing called conceptual integrity. Right? So what is this thing called conceptual integrity? It's embodied in something called ease of use. And ease of use is basically something that has to be managed, and I'm going to say this quite controversially, autocratically by the architect, not democratically. 
this ease of use, this, this unreserved focus on the customer comes from an autocratic hand, not from a democratic hand. Somewhere, someone has to make a decision to stand up and wave the flag for that customer. Okay. There's two things that affect ease of use right, in any system. One is functionality, and the other one is simplicity. You could replace simplicity with, with the negative connotation, negative word of that, which is complexity. So any system, an architect is going to sit in the middle and is torn between these two forces that pull this person apart. Right? One is functionality. As functionality increases, complexity has a tendency to increase, or simplicity decreases. It has that. If I increase, if I want to aim for simplicity and, and reduce that complexity, then I'm trying to simplify what we actually give the customer, right? So the architect, that engineering person, is the agent of the user that is sitting there imagining what it's going to be like for this user, trying to balance these two highly opposive forces, creating this really taut tension between these two things. Right? And that's what architecture is about. Right? So how do you do this? What skills do you need to be able to resolve this type of tension? Okay? Um, and I came across this a few years back, which is known as the Dreyfus model of skills acquisition. Dreyfus and his brother had, exist, had been around, I think, uh, pre-70s. Um, the state of nursing in the U.S. was really poor. Uh, the skills levels of nurses was poor. And then he came up with the model of how you acquire skills. So it's very context-based. But this is what he puts down. There's a novice level, right? Five levels. Novice, from an engineering point of view, they code with recipes. You tell them, this is, you follow the script and the code will come out and that's fine. You code with recipes. You follow it by example. You code by example. The advanced beginner, the distinct characteristic is that they work in the small, not in the large. If you give an advanced beginner the big picture, it frightens them off. They can't deal with that. They can only work in localized space, right? Local maxima. The competent is someone who's moved on from, from advanced beginner. You can see it starts seeing the bigger picture, and being able to see the bigger picture helps them to be able to troubleshoot successfully. The proficient can actually do self-correction. That is, they can correct their own behavior. Say so that, okay, wow, I shouldn't have done that. Wow, I should do this. That's self-correction. And the expert works from intuition, right? So it's something in them that they can draw upon experiences from the past, and it helps them guide them. And it's this case of we've all have that sometime in our life of uh, you just have a gut feeling it should be this way. And you go and you act on that gut feeling and it just works out, right? So that's not the most interesting thing about it. So the novice has no discretionary judgment. They cannot apply any kind of discretionary judgment on anything, right? The advanced beginner treats everything as of equal importance. They cannot discern. They cannot prioritize. The competent is able to do deliberate planning. The proficient can prioritize the importance of aspects. And the expert can envision what is possible. They can see forward and imagine and articulate what is possible. Drawing from that, at novices and advanced beginners can't estimate very well. So if you're sitting in a scrum team and you're doing those poker games and doing those points estimations, and there's a mixture of people, that estimation is seriously skewed because you have, if you have novices and advanced beginners, they are unable. They, not yet have, they do not yet have the requisite skill to be able to create any meaningful estimation. So their estimation is skewed. Okay. The, the competent and proficient, they can organize and estimate pretty well. Okay. Much better. But it means that they are in a position to be able to do self-organization. So if you're asking advanced, advanced beginners and novices to self-organize, you've got a really, really hard work ahead of you. Okay. And the expert is able to understand choices and consequences. That means that they're able to sit down and say, OK, given this situation, these are my alternatives. And if I choose this particular path, I know the consequence would be that. OK? That's a big difference. Right? So given that, when I look at those case studies, right, the software product company, it was 
the team was mostly advanced beginners, a few competent designers. Version 2, which in my opinion was their most successful rewrite, had one expert who then left the company. In the enterprise software, it was roughly an even split between novices and advanced beginners. I don't know what it's like in India, but in enterprise software development in South Africa, there's a steady flow of people that are grad levels coming into a company, getting a job, writing some code, leaving, next round comes in, because the expert, who are, those who are seeking that, um, perhaps the organization doesn't afford them the, the experience that they actually want. So they move on. Okay. And in the tooling company, it was mostly advanced beginners and one or two competent people. Right. So if we look at that again, right, and let's just apply that. So the novice, the advanced beginner and competent. When it comes to software development, the business that we're in, there's three parts to engineering, to software development. One is this theory, which is computer science. Then there's application of the theory, which is engineering. And then there's constrainment of that, of that engineering, which is the domain in which you are working. It is the context in which you work. So engineering practices applied within this business of insurance is constrained by that domain. Okay? But those three levels, the novice, the advanced being competent, they have a reliance on tools as opposed to computer science. They have a reliance. They actually end up doing do-it-yourself amateur hobby building as opposed to deliberate engineering. And they're unaware of the domain, but they rely upon specifications. So it's, just give it to me, I'll do it like that. You told me to do it like that, I'll do it like that, okay? The result of this is the code base is actually sprawls out of control, like what we've seen, right? And it happens to be that just those sprawling code bases are much harder to work with, and they cost a lot more. On the other hand, those two, the competent and, and the expert, they look to computer science to solve problems. They apply engineering practices. They really get to understand the domain and rely less on specification. If they understand the domain, they can be a true agent to the user. That's what it comes down to, as opposed to someone who has a literal, very superficial understanding of what the customer really is all about. The result of that is actually a much smaller code base that's easier to manage, right? Not through some engineering marvel, but through a combination of these things. It also happens to be quite small, and it happens to be a lot cheaper to manage and maintain. Okay. So there's two, two things that come out of that. One is that, that that caught my eye was this thing of velocity or predictability. It becomes really good for, for planning, right? But there's another concept which I call maneuverability. How can I navigate my way through? And that's useful for maintaining this thing called conceptual integrity, because along the way, we discover something new about this domain which we didn't understand, so now it causes me to do a U-turn and move around. So I'm not so interested in velocity, I'm interested in how can I move. It's exactly like traffic here in India, right? It's slow moving, but you can move around quite freely, almost, well, most of the time, or sometimes. Scarily, but it's true, and it is the same thing with software development. That maneuverability comes with fear because you don't know whether it's a gap you can take, but it, you can do that, right? I start value, I've started valuing maneuverability much higher than velocity or predictability. And then there's this other thing, right? So it doesn't mean that we don't have room for novices and advanced beginners, we need to have them. But it's a learning process, right? Novices do a lot of, need to do a lot of self-learning. Those in between, there's training, there's coaching, and then it goes full circle. When you're an expert, you go back to self-learning, and then your context changes, and then you become a novice again for a new, new area. Okay. So when I look at all of that, those are aspects about how do we maintain conceptual integrity, which is being the agent to the user, establishing a, an agency with the user, and, and, and just enforcing that all our judgments, our decision-making is based on ease of use, which is this balance between simplicity and functionality. Okay? And there's a the requisite skill levels that come with that, that allows us to do that. It is not something that anybody can do. Okay? Balancing the tension is quite complicated. On this side here, where we're managing the constraints, you know, 
constraints are actually pretty simple, right? It's those things. But from an engineering perspective, you have to take those things into consideration, right? And I find many teams where they actually are aware of the budget, they're aware of the deadline, they're aware of the capacity that's available, but for some reason you completely ignore it. Those things influence your decisions. Given this constraint, this is what I am able to do, okay? And there's nothing wrong with declaring that with the person that you're working with. You know, we have this amount of time, this is what we can achieve, so you have a reasonable, polite discussion. It's not about, you know, it's people do two things. Yeah, yeah, definitely I'll finish it, and you burn the midnight oil, and, you know, you get burnt out. Or you just say, no, no, it's impossible, but you can't say why. Right? So you get both. But here's something that I've observed. Unconstrained teams, and in agile software development, you, you, you're swinging from highly constrained to a certain amount of freedom that comes with self-organization, etc. and this whole thing of cross-functional teams and democracy within teams. When teams work unconstrained, this is my observation, they tend to spend a lot of time debating architectural decisions, design decisions, an extraordinary amount of time. If you think about, just reflect upon your backlog grooming sessions, your sprint planning sessions, those types of things, they say, okay, do it in two hours, and it'll take the whole day, you know, and it's not even finished because next morning they'll still start talking about it over tea and things like that. It just carries on and on. It's unconstrained. And the consequence of that is that the implementation gets shortchanged, right? That's the first consequence. The implementation is shortchanged. You're so st stuck in this thing of talking about it, that you're actually not doing it. And because you're not doing it, you've actually delayed your feedback loop to such an extent. The consequence of that feedback loop disappearing or being retarded or lagging is that your domain knowledge is unconfirmed. You don't know whether you really understand this domain. Okay? So the sooner you move to trying an option that's on the table, the sooner you move towards trying an option on the table, that's been debated, the sooner you can confirm your understanding. The longer you delay it, you're losing that last responsible moment. Now the last, the way I understand last responsible moment is the last responsible moment for making a committed decision. I have these options available. At the last moment, I want to co commit to this one. That's what it comes down to. And there's lots more which we'll talk about. So that's about the constraints, right? And that's pretty straightforward. So, there's these extremes. You can leave a team unconstrained, and this is what happens. Even though you're working in this agile process, it's unconstrained, you start having a, a highly uh, retarded or delayed feedback loop, and things start moving out longer than you expect. Okay. Now, to create value from the management side, you have to respect conceptual integrity. If, as a manager, you understand that the person on the other side of the table on the engineering side, is standing there to protect conceptual integrity, then you have to respect that position, because that is in the position that is taking the interest of you, all our customers. It's a common customer. Okay. So conceptual integrity from this side of the table is actually a single philosophy. It's one philosophy about the system, and that single philosophy can flow from a very small number of minds, maybe two or three, but often one person will reflect the single philosophy, right? And the single philosophy is manifest in that ease of use, right? It's actually creating a mental model that, that says this is how the user will perceive the system, this is how they will work. So if you think back to the early days of something like, something like uh, let's say Excel, right? Uh, it's a simple thing. There's rows and columns and cells. You can put in values and you can put in formulae. Okay. Then you have weird things like pivots and all sorts of stuff happening. Okay. When those things get thrown in, you're actually altering the mental model of the user. Okay. Now, as long as those features satisfy the conceptual integrity that this is how we can work with data, it's one more thing we can use to work with data, then it's absolutely fine. But if it breaks that conceptual integrity, 
right? It's just a nice to have that breaks the mental model of how we work with the system as a user, then we're in trouble, okay? So this poor manager is stuck in the same position as the architect, but with different forces. Mostly, he's trying to balance this thing of democracy and autocracy, okay? So with democracy, we want to encourage democracy and we should have democracy. And what we mean by democracy is that we actually are willing to receive the ideas of everyone. Okay? That's what it comes down to. But not all ideas will make it in. If the idea is to the detriment of the conceptual integrity of the system, you cannot include it. So what happens if you have a flood of ideas that threaten the conceptual integrity of the system? It means our original mental model of the system is, is warped. It's wrong. In that case, it's absolutely cheaper. I have no reservation in saying it. it is cheaper then to abort, create a new conceptual model, and start, and start incorporating those ideas. In the lean world, they call that a pivot. Okay, let's switch. Oops, wrong idea. Completely, let's switch to here. Right? But there's also an amount of autocracy associated with this. That is when it is a beneficial, it's very benevolent autocracy that says that this person here will sit here and will make a judgment call based on ease of use, that mental model that will be retained and honored for this particular idea. Okay. There's also this notion of aristocracy that exists in teams. This elitism of architects and the rest and developers and testers and all sorts of different things you know, lead developer and junior developer. It's this aristocracy that exists amongst that. And there is no reason for that, okay? And all of it comes down to one simple human thing, is that we all have entered this industry because it's a creative industry, and we want to exercise our creativity. But there's opportunity to exercise creativity in multitude of ways at all aspects of software development, right? So, there's no reason for it not, there's no reason for it to exist. But autocracy and democracy, there will be that interplay. At the end of the day, it's the buck must stop somewhere, someone has to make a decision. So if I think of it in a political context, at let's say a national level, if you had to have a referendum on a contentious issue right now, right, and it's basically a referendum is going to be an opinion, it's an opinion poll. And if you had to pass a law based on the opinion poll, is that law in the interest of the people or is it the interest of opinions? It's not necessarily that it's in the interest and well-being of the country. Okay, so it is there as a way of establishing what is actually going on. So there's two other things that threat conceptual integrity. The first one is called featureitis. Now in medicine terms, anything with the word itis means inflammation of. Right? So if I say I have appendicitis, it's inflammation of appendix. Tonsillitis is append inflammation of tonsils. Featureitis is inflammation of features. Right? So here's the thing. There's some great ideas out there. And when you look at it and you think, wow, that's fantastic. Right? And it's so appealing on onset that you actually rush out and say, let's just do it. Okay? And you could do your estimations. Right? You'll do your whole planning poker and all sorts of things. And you look at this and you say, yeah, 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 we can do it and we'll finish it in this sprint or two sprints time, whatever it is, and you go for it, right? So you put your head down and you run into it and you try to do it. But the real cost comes up during implementation. That is undeniable. You will hit some stone walls and you say, oh my goodness, what about this? Whoops, didn't think of that one, let me change that. And all the time what you're doing is that you're actually destroying conceptual integrity to accommodate this really cool thing, which seems so great in onset. Over time, it's this thing that is destroying ease of use. It's corrupting the mental model of the, for the user of what the system and the way it behaves and the way it works. Completely destroying it, okay? After feature, it sneaks up upon you, right? So this thing of incremental development, right? It's like me snacking every night, you know, on a biscuit and a cup of coffee, and after a while you end up like this, right? It bloat, okay? It's incremental. It didn't happen overnight. Come on, it didn't happen overnight. I didn't even see it coming, it's this insidious thing. It's not my fault, I 
my mental model of myself is not this. I can tell you that now, right? But it creeps up on you. You know, wow, that's a great thing. Let's have that. What's that? Nice as well, you know. So, and that's the real cost of implementation. And now you can imagine the effort to get me back down to trim weight, okay? That's the effort that has to go in each of those case studies, right? It's serious. You're going to burn more. There's this other concept, right, of amorphous users. Now, remember we're talking about that we're agents to the user. Now, how can we be an agent to a user if we have an amorphous user? We have no idea of what the user is. So if you speak to people in the design world and user experience world, they'll talk about creating personas and things like that. And there's a reason for that. It's to give you something concrete to attach to so you have some idea of what that person or that user represents. And for a single system, you have sets of users. There's category that works with the system like this. There's a category that works like that. There's a category that works like that. Okay? And if you have large groups of amorphous users, then every single person in that team working on that system has a different idea of what the user is about. So how can you ensure conceptual integrity if you don't know what, who's, whose interests you're representing and what are their own interests? Right? So this is what I try to do. I ask four questions. I ask who, who are they, right? So just talk about who are they. Who are these? Who is this group of users? The next one is what do they need? Let's just talk about that. And then what do they think they need? What do those users think they need? Right? And the last question, which is really the one that kicks you in the gut, is what do they really want? You know, it's the whole... Ford story that you've most probably heard and quoted many times over about, you know, they wanted a faster horse, but we gave them a car, so that they actually want a car, you know, and it'll definitely be black. So it's that old story. So you have to go through this process of asking those questions, and you get to the last one and says, what do they really need? Which is why the iPhone came about, and it's been quoted so many times here today, this, this week. You know, the iPhone, the iPod, all of those things. What do they really need? It didn't happen from a set of requirements and specifications. So, that comes down, that's, that's just two worlds, right? And I'm saying to you that when I try to balance those two parts of the world, the single thread that I find most useful is this thing called conceptual integrity, okay? Which is the binding thread for a manager and an architectural engineering team. The engineering team will carry and wave that flag in the interest of the user, and the manager is going to impose constraints, but respect that this person on the other side is actually working for the integrity of the system and in the interests of the customer. So one is maintaining and treasuring that, and the other one has to respect the decisions that come out of that. And if you can justify your engineering decisions based in the interest of the user without destroying that conceptual integrity, it's easier to argue with something around that that's very concrete than it is to say, well, I don't think you can do that. No, 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 it's impossible. You know what it means from a database migration to be able to do that? No, no, we're not going to do that. Forget it. You know, those kinds of discussions are actually worthless. So what is this thing called concept? What, what form does it take, this conceptual integrity? In many forms. You could, you know, Jeff Patton talks about a story map. That's a way of describing the conceptual integrity of the system. That's what it is. You could have a system metaphor. Right? And that system metaphor describes the conceptual integrity. You break the metaphor, you break the integrity. You, you're lost. You've gone off on a tangent. Right? It could be sketches that you put down. It could be in, in a financial services industry where we're doing forex trades. Um, the conceptual integrity was embodied in one single spreadsheet. And we could use the spreadsheet to, to show the different trades that exist, different ways in which it happens. Now, it's not that we spent months design, designing the spreadsheet, but it was there to say that this is dependent on that, and even if the calculations were not embodied in there, it was a way of doing that. Find something that is concrete, that is of relevance to the domain in which you're working. But please don't do this, right? Don't wave in the air around what the system is going to be like. There's no conceptual integrity that comes from hand-waving, okay? There's a way, that there's this thing of PowerPoint architects, which is you can use something like PowerPoint to 
illustrate the conceptual integrity of the system. You can do that. You could have slides that transition that just show a particular scenario unfolding. But that is far different from a PowerPoint architect waving the hand in the air and saying, OK, this database we've chosen and that framework, et cetera, that's got nothing to do with conceptual integrity. Maybe technical integrity, yes, but not conceptual integrity. So that leaves us here, right? That conceptual integrity of the system is something that we should treasure. And I find that it actually bridges the two. It pulls them closer. Not necessarily, you know, hands around shoulders, but it definitely brings them closer. And there's a few landmarks that we visited here. First one is incremental development, which you had a giggle at me about, right? So this insidious, gradual increase in bloat. Uh, feedback, OK? So here's the way I approach feedback. I want to receive it as soon as possible, but I want to react to it as late as possible. I'd rather gather it, but I want to have a deliberate plan of action of when I want to react to it. And often the mistake that's made is that receive and react immediately. That's one choice. React immediately is one choice. You can delay your reaction to an appropriate time. You may wait for more to create a data set to say, OK, it's definitely something that we should act upon. You might put a bug fix down and a workaround before you actually fix it in production at a later sprint. I talked about velocity and the fact that I, I value maneuver, maneuverability a lot more this interplay of democracy and autocracy. Deliver value. So again, I'm going to reiterate this. We can deliver value when we give, when the software itself presents an elegant, elegant, coherent mental model for the user. It's this thing of, given the software, I don't have to think about it. I'll just use it. It makes sense because I know my business, and I'll just use it. Right? That's what we're after. But why do we bother with that? is because the software we write is not about the machines. It's all about us, helping one user at a time. And the more we corrupt the mental model, we corrupt users, the more disservice we are making to humanity. So warnings. There's this quite a few confusion points here. First one is that this conceptual integrity is not big design upfront. If you think about the maneuverability and last responsible moment, you're exploring a domain. You're looking at options. You're building it up in a very evolutionary way, as long as you're actually still retaining it. So, the, so it can increase, right? But if you think of it as a nice hole, you don't want to suddenly just have a little bulge on the side, a little thing sticking out here. That's when you're violating that. The fragility of the conceptual integrity is unknown. You don't know. This is the reality of software development. No matter what you design, no matter what you build, you're only one requirement away from collapse. Extinction level event of your entire design. You can't predict that. It just takes one requirement, and three quarters of your ideas maybe may just collapse under that. And it's a valuable, necessary requirement. OK? You can't predict that. The idea is to try to find those early. So feasibility is different from value. Feasibility is driven by project constraints, people, budgets, all of those things. That's independent of the value. Value is what you give to the user in terms of ease of use. And also, it's not about elitism. Right? It's not about aristocracy and creating those hierarchies in the team. Okay? There are proficients and experts. Those five levels may seem like elitism. Right? Proficients and experts, in my opinion, are generational in a team. It's generational. So, are we there yet? My answer is no. It's plain and simple. I think we've just begun. We're just starting to understand the essence of software development. And we're just starting to understand the impact of software development on the rest of the world. Okay? The reality is that we're not trying to change the world. We are changing the world. The moment you release a piece of software, you've affected another person. We might as well try to do it in a nice way and be nice about it. Okay? So avoid this conceptual corruption that happens between each of us. Okay? So I don't have anything further to say. Um, this entire presentation in that style is available online. It's at, I don't think you can, can you read that at the bottom? 
bit.ly, WQE5MP. I mean, that sounds like a coupon code. But Bitly gives out coupon codes. And so anyway, so this entire presentation, in its entire form, like that, where you can click through, find the parts that you want. Sure. Right, so it's bit.ly slash uppercase W QE lowercase 5 M P. Um, I'll most probably embed this on my soporific blog as well, so you could get it from there as well. But I'll do that later in the week. So thank you for your time. Thank you for enduring and not walking out. And I hope there's something here that you could take away. Um, or there's something here you can challenge me on. I'll be willing to hear that. So open for questions, discussion. Thank you. Yes. So the question is that uh, I've spoken about the balance between architect and managers, and where does the notion of product owner comes from? Okay. So one of the first uh, notions of, or ideas around agility came from extreme programming. And in extreme programming, they said, bring the customer on site, work with the customer. Okay. Um, and then Scrum came along and said, Here's, you know, we can't always have the customer on site. Let's get a product owner. Okay. Um, so the product owner became a proxy for the customer in that sense, right? In product development companies, we've had traditionally product managers, which were responsible for either a portfolio of products or single product. Okay. Um, so in, in extreme programming uh, situation, those, that team, those, maybe the one person, that main architect was actually the product owner engaging with the customer. Okay? And here we've moved it over to a, someone else who has this responsibility of being the center point with the customer. I find that very difficult to work with. And last year when I gave a talk around product ownership, I proposed that the product owner in the traditional sense in Scrum and the architect or the person who holds that conceptual integrity in the team, actually one, one body. They should be working really, really tightly together to be able to do this. So in this sense here, uh, the product owner could be the architect in that sense who is establishing this mental model, this coherent mental model and then you have other people who are just doers, who are designers and, and you know, at software design level implementing it. So that is why when I started, I said this notion of manager and architect is very loosely defined here. So manager could be anyone who's responsible for the constraints of the project, and the architect is anyone who's responsible for the conceptual integrity of the project. Does that answer your question? Okay, so it's changed over time. I think it'll come back to Yes. Sorry, I can't hear you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Maneuverability. It's a hard word to say, though. Yes. 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 either measuring or discerning this maneuverability? Um, I think yes, at various levels. Um, actually, what makes you maneuverable is uh, eliciting feedback pretty quickly. So whether you're doing a paper prototype, that gives you an option to maneuver. If you're actually going into development itself with code, you'd want to put in instrumentation very early on, on that piece of code so that you can maybe track click-throughs or something like that, okay? Uh, pretty early on, so you can get that feedback which says that, okay, I have something here, right? But it's not good enough to just say, I'm now measuring that. 
because you need to know where the gap is next. So you can only be, you can only, you can only maneuver if you know what your options are. Okay, which comes down to something that we tend not to do. We tend to debate options, choose one, and discard the others. Right? We say this is the better design. Let's go for that. Right? So those ones are poor. I keep all options on the table until there's feedback to say that this is moving in the right direction. So to build in, at a technical level, to build in instrumentation to deter determine whether the idea is moving forward, is moving us forward. But also that given this information, already you must know how to analyze that information so you can actually choose an alternative path that you already know exists. Okay. Um, you do get cases where people will try both options. They play it off. Okay. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But you could you just think about creating what is the feedback loop I want? What in the feedback loop do I want to gather? Right? And if I gather this information, what would I do with it? So whether it's a paper prototype, whether it's a thought experiment that you create, whether it's a conversation and a walkthrough of a story map with a customer, whether it's a piece of code on a web page that, is, that you've changed, you've got to find something that to create that feedback loop. Okay? Yes? So how do you, how do you deal with that technical debt that's accumulating? So, Absolutely. That's, that's an honest, open declaration. Absolutely honest, open declaration, yeah. right? So how do, we, how, how, do we, how do we firstly become, make everyone aware of that? That's the first thing. That, look, if we're going to do this, it doesn't break the conceptual integrity, but our design choice will incur something that makes this thing less, it makes this more rigid. It reduces our maneuverability down the line. That's the thing that we have to talk about. Okay? And that comes from those people at the right skill levels that can see the big picture, can envision, can predict what's going to happen. It might not come from one person, but it has to be an open declaration. You know, it's like, you know, if you have a plumber come into your house and there's a leaky tap and he says, well, you know, I can just put some epoxy on it. It'll stop for three days, but in order to fix it, for real, I have to break the wall and I've got to do that. It's the same thing. You'd rather hear that and deal with that and take that into consideration. The accumulation of that is, is a different problem. In the brownfields in environment where you have legacy code base, how you turn that around is different. Those strategies are different uh, because in, in brownfields environment, you're trying to, trying to claw back conceptual integrity. Whereas in green fields, you are stab establishing conceptual integrity from the outset. Okay, so in brown fields, you can establish, you, you claw back your conceptual integrity, and then there must be some parts of your code base that you're going to say, this doesn't fit into this model anymore. We are actually going to deprecate these things. And there's different techniques around that. Um, are you going to come to the technical track? No? No. Okay, so I, if, if you bear with me, I can tell you one technique that I've done successfully, and that is that um, I actually claw back technical inte uh, or conceptual integrity by analyzing the data. So all scenarios, all use cases are recorded in your database. It's there, okay? So typically what I would do is find a way of uh, articulating in, in data what a particular use case is, right? So for example, if we know that it's a workflow thing and you go from this step to that step to that step. I would concatenate all the steps and say, here's a very unique scenario. Here's another one, here's another one, here's another one. And I'll do a frequency count of that. So I create a histogram, okay? And what that does is that you actually find the long tail very quickly, okay? So we haven't yet touched code. We're analyzing existing data. That is myth busting. That's all it is, okay? And based on that, you can draw a line and say, ignore that, okay? So, thank you.